Uh, thanks for the intro introduction. I used to be in Ten uh, in J and uh, Bodhi's group uh, probably four years ago. It was a long time, <laughs> long time back. And today I would like to uh, introduce our recent research on building uh, very low power communication sensing and computation systems on Internet of Things. In recent years, we have seen a massive number of IoT devices fabricated by the factory and shipped to the market. And we can see that last year, the IoT market is larger than the combined market of smartphone, tablets, and PC. And this trend is can keep growing. And IoTs are basically serving a fundamental gateway connecting the digital world with the physical world. Examples of these devices include such as implantable devices such as a pill cam, which monitors and uh, the, uh, how the, your digestive uh, system work. And wearable systems such as smart contact lens, which measures the glucose levels in tears. And mobile systems such as um, uh, life locking cameras, which record what you see every day. So um, unfortunately, uh, over the past several years, we have built very powerful tools, such as machine learning tools, to understand the data that we have in the digital world. But we actually have only have limited understanding about the physical world. The fundamental reason is that we are not able to capture lots of data in the physical world. For example, when a patient comes to the hospital, very likely this guy has been sick already, right? And in some cases, for example, like the cancer, when the people come to the hospital, it has already been too late. If we can deploy IoT system that is able to continuously monitor the health status of the person, then we, are, we might be able to identify and treat the diseases uh, at a much earlier stage. Another example is like the uh, toys that is played by the kids. We don't know how the kids are assembling and playing with the, uh, many toys, such as the Lego bricks. If we have a way to monitor how the kids put two pieces of the Lego bricks together and how they finish the whole projects, we might be able to infer the mental development of the kids. The reason why, so what's stopping us from collecting and understanding lots of the data in the physical world? What's stopping us from building such an IoT system? I believe there are two fundamental limiting factors. The first factor is that we don't have sufficient energy to run to continuously run the IoT device. The second factor is that we are not able to connect, always connect the IoT device to the internet because of the high radio power consumption. Because of the two limitations, as a result, we cannot perform continuous health monitoring and we cannot always provide uh, useful and meaningful health diagnosis data for the patients. And we cannot pack the uh, battery plus Bluetooth and sensors into every Lego bricks in order to understand how the kids play with Lego, right? So, but I think that's our limitations that we are facing right now. I believe that it's possible for us to build continuous operated IOTs that are always connected to the internet. Towards this vision, I built two types of the system. The first system is a low power wireless connections for IOTs. We are able to connect IOT device to the internet while consuming 100 to 10 times less power compared to existing Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. All we do so by reflecting the packets from Wi-Fi and Bluetooth while embedding our information. We also design a system that is able to efficiently support applications on energy constraint platforms. In particular, we build a system that is able to run very complicated applications on uh, resource constraint energy harvesting systems. So let's from the first start from the first one. How do we actually connect to the internet today? Well, 
when we connect the IoT device to the internet, we usually use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, right? Unfortunately, both consume lots of power. This figure shows the power consum uh, consumption comparison between the wireless radio versus other module in an embedded system. We can see that even the most power efficient radio, Bluetooth low energy, it consumes four orders, orders magnet more power compared to a simple accelerometer sensor, two orders magnet more power compared to the processor unit, which is a microcontroller, five times more power compared to the storage unit SRAM. As a result, the wireless radio has become the bottleneck of reducing the power consumption of the overall system. Ideally, we want to have a radio that it only consume around 100 microwatts of power. Then, if we can have such system, such a radio, it's, po it's possible for us to build an IoT system that does not need battery. We can use some energy harvester to provide sufficient energy to run the overall system. So why a wireless radio consume lots of power for communicating the data? Right? That's a question. If we want to design really low power radio, the first question we will have to understand is why the radio consume lots of power. The fundamental reason is that when a wireless radio transmits its information, it has to produce a wireless signal. When the radio produces a wireless signal, it will involve two power hungry components. One is baseband processing and one is analog RF circuits. Both are very expensive in terms of power. In this particular case, LTE, we can see that both the baseband and the RF circuits consume roughly two watts of power. Very expensive. Over the past 20 years, many engineers tried to design novel circuits such as amplifier, mixture, and processors to reduce the power consumption of the radio. Unfortunately, right now, the power consumption of wireless radio is still on the order of tens or 20 milliwatts, much larger than our expectation. So the key question we want to ask here is, is it possible for us to use a different way for communicating the data? In particular, we ask, is it possible for us to leverage signal reflection for communicating the data? Actually, this idea is not new. 200 years ago, mirror was invented, right? The mirror is able to reflect a light from the source to the destination. The mirror does not need a battery for reflecting the light. More importantly, when we change the materials of the mirror, it's able to re uh, change the intensity of the reflected light. So the intensity of the reflected light indicates the material information of the mirror. So the question, we got inspired by this observation, and we are thinking about, is it possible for us to build something like the mirror, but in the RF domain? So that's the system that we built. We built a very special device called a back air tag in the middle, which is able to reflect a signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter to the Wi-Fi receiver. During the signal reflection, the particular device, the tag here, is able to embed its own information. Since the special tag we designed here does not generate a wireless signal for communicating its data, as a result, the power consumption of the tag is very low for communicating the data. So here is a demo of our system. We have a Wi-Fi transmitter which use an Intel 5300 Wi-Fi card. We have a Wi-Fi receiver, which is my laptop. Our special tag is the sitting in the middle. The Wi-Fi transmitter transmits the packet. The packet is reflected by the tag to the receiver. During the signal reflection, the tag embeds the ECG sensor data on top of the reflected signal. The receiver receives the reflected signal extract the ECG sensor data and display the sensor data in real time. So how could we build something like uh, this? It sounds like a magic, right? How do we actually build a system? Well, 
the key component here comes from the hardware design of the special tag. This figure shows the hardware diagram of the tag that we built. We have two components here. One is a load, which is running all the computational stuff on the tag side, has an impedance of ZL here. One is the RF circuits of the tag, which has an impedance of ZS here. And we have a special circuit, not special, it's, called, it's a circuit in the middle called imp imp impedance matching circuit, which is able to ma make sure the impedance of the RF circuit here is equal to the impedance of the load. When the impedance of the RF circuit equals to the impedance of the load, then the tag does not reflect the signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter to the Wi-Fi receiver. That's because all the RF energy that is perceived by the antenna will be absorbed by the load. So we play some trick. We can use a very special device called RF switch here to change the impedance of the RF circuits. When we tune the status of the RF switch here, we change the impedance in a way such that the RF circuit's impedance does not match the impedance of the load. As a result, the input RF signal here will be reflected to other locations. By changing the impedance, our tag is able to reflect the signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter to the Wi-Fi receiver. So the logic for the tag to encode its own information on top of Wi-Fi becomes very simple, right? Uh, there are many paths, right? The signal will propagate from the transmitter to the receiver. Mm -hmm. And you have only one point that you're doing the reflection or not. How effective is that one point? Do you have to carefully design where that one point is? You don't have to. Uh, I think the question you are asking is that how, what kind of the signal loss you are having from the tag to the receiver, right? Or, or from the other path. Right, the transmitter will transmit something from bounce from a wall, mm -hmm. get to the receiver. Mm -hmm. Even though you're absorbing the energy here, mm -hmm. it's still going to have that path, this mm -hmm. reactive frame. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good question. And the answer is that we don't affect from the signal that is reflected by the wall, because I will talk about later, the signal reflected by the tag will be operating a different channel compared to the Wi-Fi transmitter channel. Okay. I will talk about later, about how could we do that. Any other questions? All right. So the logic of encoding the tag data becomes very simple, right? If the tag wants to transmit it at zero, it only have to close RF switch and does not reflect the packet from the Wi-Fi transmitter to the Wi-Fi receiver. If the tag wants to transmit data one, it will, ref it will open its up switch and reflect the packet from the Wi-Fi transmitter to the Wi-Fi receiver. It's a very simple mechanism of encoding the tag information on top of existing unknown Wi-Fi packets. Unfortunately, if you build a system like this, one of the limitations you are having is very low tag data rate. The reason is that you are mapping one tag one bit of the tag information on top of one Wi-Fi packet. If you look at a commercial Wi-Fi transmitter, usually it sends us roughly around 1,000 or at most 2,000 packets per second. It's already a lot. So the data rate that you can achieve using this mechanism is only on the order of 500 bits per second. It's very, very low, right? We can do some simple operations by we can support some simple sensing applications using this radio, but if we want to support content-rich sensors, such as cameras, we cannot use such radios because the bandwidth is too low. So the question we ask here is that, is it possible for us to design low power, but also high data rate of uh, the communication? By high data rate, I mean several hundred kilobits per second. So in order to answer this question, we cannot embed one, tag of, one bit of tag information on one Wi-Fi packet. We have to dive into the Wi-Fi packet structure 
to understand how could we embed information there. So let's look at one particular Wi-Fi system, 11B Wi-Fi system. In the 11B Wi-Fi system, when the Wi-Fi transmitter transmits information to the receiver, it does not directly transmit data 0 or data 1. In order to transmit the data 0, it will transmit the blue code word. In order to transmit data 1, it will transmit the red code word. So once the corresponding code word is selected based on the COM payload of the packet, a signal will be, pr will be produced on the physical layer and transmitted to the Wi-Fi receiver. Our key observation here is that for a Wi-Fi system, we only use a fixed number of the code words to transmit the Wi-Fi information. More importantly, we found that we can actually convert one code word to another by performing some simple operation. In this particular example, we can convert the red code word to the blue code word by multiplying minus one. We can do the same conversion to convert the blue code word to the red code word. So the insight we get here is that if we can design a tag that can perform such simple operation in a low power fashion, then we are able to embed the tag information on the bit level of a Wi-Fi packet. Let's look at the example of how our tag embeds its own information on top of Wi-Fi packet, on top of the Wi-Fi bits. If the tag wants to transmit data zero, it will reflect the code word that is used by the transmitter to the Wi-Fi receiver without any modification. If the tag wants to transmit data one, it will reflect the code word from the transmitter to the receiver. However, during the signal reflection, the tag will convert the code word to a different code word. The most important thing here is, is that during the conversion, the tag has to make sure that the signal here is still a wi valid Wi-Fi signal. Otherwise, we cannot use commercial Wi-Fi receiver to receive this signal. So in summary, the lo How do you detect the big boundary? So we are detecting the starting point of the Wi-Fi packet, and we run a timer or starting from the starting point of the Wi-Fi packet to identify where is the payload and at which bit should you inject your information. The arrow of detecting the starting point of the Wi-Fi packet is uh, smaller than 300 nanoseconds. As long as the arrow is smaller than this threshold, we are able to do successfully uh, conversion. And you detect it in a battery free way? So no, you know, we are using an envelope detector, which consumes roughly 1 milliamp of power. So the total power consumption of our uh, device right now is 2.5 milliamp. Many so to, to do that detection. Many because of the detection here. So it's not completely battery free? It's not battery free right now. It's a battery power device. Does the tag reflect on the same channel as the receiver? It will reflect on different channels. I, I will it one time. Yeah, I will cover the part okay. soon. Any other questions? All right. So here is the logic of the tag encodes its own information. If the tag wants to transmit data zero, it will reflect the code word from the transmitter to the Wi-Fi receiver without any modification. If the tag wants to transmit data one, it will convert the code word during the signal reflection. If you look at this table and write down the logic of this table, you can find that the back serial code word, which is a reflected code word here, is actually the XOR between the tag data and the Wi-Fi transmitter code word. And decoding the tag data becomes really simple, right? You only have to use two receivers, one receiving on the reflected channel to get the back serial code word, one receiving on the Wi-Fi transmitter channel to receive the Wi-Fi transmitter signal. Then you only have to XOR the two packets received by the two receivers, then you are able to decode the tag data. By doing so, the Wi-Fi transmitter can transmit arbitrary packets that it wants to transmit. So the question here is that how does the tag actually perform such simple operation, right? How does it do 
perform such operations physically. In previous example, we mentioned that the tag can multiply the code word by minus one for converting the code word. So how does the tag introduce the operation of multiplying minus one in a low power fashion? Uh, uh, I have a question actually uh, in, in the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So it, it, for this to work, mm -hmm. so the, the, the original Wi-Fi transmitter has to synchronize the, the, with the Wi-Fi receiver in the, uh, in the sense that uh, the, 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 the reflector cannot just reflect uh, like uh, the Wi-Fi signal from any transmitter. Right? Yes. It has to be agreed upon yep. beforehand. Yep. Yes, the, 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 basically the question you're asking is that how does the tech know which signal should I reflect, right? So there is a synchronization protocol that we're running. So there's a patent that is sent out by the Wi-Fi transmitter, mm -hmm. tells the tech that I'm going to send the packets that you will transfer. You can inject data on top of that. So the, the patent of the packets is basically the length of the packets. We are not modifying the content of the packet, but we are using the length of the packets to tell the tag, I'm going to send you a packet where you can embed your data. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and, uh, but it also needs to synchronize among those three, meaning that the, the, uh, the receiver will have to know when the tag will start sending data. Mm. Yes. The way the, this receiver will mo always monitor on the back server channel, mm -hmm. and the the receiver will decode all the packets that it will receive on this particular channel. So some of the packets might come from other devices, not from the, this guy here. Mm -hmm. so the way we detect, we decode the back server packets say, is that with the, the, when the tag transmits the information, it also has a packet structure. Mm -hmm. So by looking at whether the structure within the Wi-Fi packet exists or not, the receiver is able to identify whether this packet is reflected by the tag or is produced by some other devices. Okay. So, uh, yeah, continue, that's fine. <laughs> so let, let, let's assume that like, uh, if you have two reflectors mm -hmm. within the range, will it work? Two tag, right? Uh, two tag, yeah, two tag. Yes, we have a MacLary protocol okay. with that so we... So you, you are, like, try to uh, synchronize in a way such yeah. that on the server side, there's no collision. Yeah, it's very similar to the RFID. The synchronization uh -huh. is done by the transmitter. So the RFID synchronization is done by the RFID reader, okay. right? So uh, as we mentioned here, the simple operation that could be performed by the tag is multiplying minus one. So how does the tag introduce the multiply minus one operation in a low power fashion? So let's think about what does multiply minus one mean for a signal. It actually means there is a 180 degrees phase change for the signal, right, for a wireless signal. If you multiply a wireless signal by minus one, it means you are changing the phase of the signal by 180 degrees. So the question becomes, how could the tag introduce 180 degrees phase modification in a low power fashion? Well, one intuitive answer is using phase shifter. Phase shifter is a particular device which can produce a desired phase shifting. Unfortunately, for example, this particular phase shifter can seem lots of power, 400 microwatts. So we don't want to use a phase shifter to produce such desired phase shifting. Let's think a, a slightly a bit more about what does 180 degrees phase shifting mean for a wireless signal. It actually means that you are delaying the signal in the time domain by half cycle. As long as we, you can design a tag which is able to delay the signal by half cycle in the time domain, you are able to produce such 180 degrees phase shifting. We build a digital circuits which delay the signal by half cycle and only consume one microwatts of power. So the 180 degree phase shift, does it happen at the carrier level or the no. sub-carrier level? And, oh, that's a good question. In, um, on the uh, carrier level, in terms of the OFDM level, oh, okay. not on the sub-carrier level, because our tag we design right now is frequency agnostic. So you cannot, it, you, you, you could modify the phase of each sub-carrier, but it's very power expensive. Right? 
So, uh, would it affect other transmissions, other Wi-Fi going on in the in the? You already know. The reason is that the reflected signal strength is very low. Even if you look at our commercial RFID device, the signal strength is on the order of minus 60 or minus 70 dBm. So it's usually lower compared to normal Wi-Fi access point you are using in the office building. But if you are in a scenario where your Wi-Fi connectivity is already in the, on the boundary of the connection, then yes, our device will introduce interference. So on the receiver side, if, uh, if there's a collision by caused by a signal from other devices on the same channel, yeah. So then what do you do? Because from from this, I see that the information flows one way, meaning that the tag will not know whether this transmission is succeeded or not. Mm -hmm. the, like uh, the, in such scenario, if mm -hmm. there's a information loss, then mm -hmm. like. Uh, how, how do you provide a reliable transform uh, data communication between the tag and the receiver, right? Yeah. So we are having a, a protocol that is running on the transmitter side. So basically we have a backend that is connecting the transmitter and the receiver. Mm -hmm. I mean the backend connecting the Wi-Fi transmitter and Wi-Fi receiver. That tells the Wi-Fi, that, that the Wi-Fi receiver knows which packets is collided or not, right? Mm -hmm. And it will feed this information back to the transmitter. Transmitter will tell the tag, uh, do you have to retransmit? Okay. That's our current, uh, we didn't implement this, mm -hmm. but that's our hypothesis. <coughs> and uh, for many of the applications we are supporting right now, we think it might not be able, we might not provide reliable transmission. If the data is lost, just transmit it again. For example, for the vision application, right? You, you lose some data, some pixels in the picture. It but seems to be. But the tag needs to know that it, yeah. it should transmit. It shall transmit again. That, yep. that, that should be a, like a sort of a feedback. Yeah, feedback. We have to. Yeah, we have to build a feedback. Yes. There's one way. The tag cannot receive anything. Oh yeah. No, no, no. From the That's from what the I. Receiver. The tag yeah. can receive from the transmitter. In general, this yeah. tag doesn't receive. But does the tag do kind of the standard RFID like pulse width modulated communication with the reader? Can it? Can the Can the transmitter? Yeah. The, can the Wi-Fi transmitter implement yeah. some kind of a pulse width modulated? That's exactly what I was uh, uh, referring to. The Wi-Fi transmitter is actually the is doing the pulse width modulation by changing the length of the Wi-Fi packets. Because think about it, we are built, we actually we built this one. We built the intermediate firmware that is sitting between the NIC and the socket. So when the socket push the packet into the NIC, this in uh, the, this particular firmware is able to adjust the length of the packet before feeding into the NIC for running the uh, communication from the Wi-Fi transmitter to the tag. All right. So we just uh, described that we are able to embed the tag information on top of 11B Wi-Fi traffic, right? But we found that this technology we invented here is not only limited to embedding the data on 11B. The fundamental reason is that a wireless signal is transmitting information on three dimensions. We can imp the wireless signal can transmit information in the amplitude, in the frequency, or in the phase. In the previous example, we were modifying the phase to embed the tag information, right? We could also modify the amplitude to embed our information, as, as well as the frequency to embed the tag information. By modifying the three dimensions of the wireless signal, we are able to embed the tag information on top of 11B, 11G Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Zigbee. So the last question is that how should we decode and receive the tag information, right? As you mentioned, if you directly use a Wi-Fi receiver to, re to receive the reflected, wi uh, the reflected Wi-Fi packets from the tag, unfortunately, you don't receive anything. <laughs> the fundamental reason is that when the receiver receives the packets, from the tag, in addition to receiving the reflected packets, the receiver also received 
the signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter. And usually, the signal from the Wi-Fi transmitter is much louder compared to the reflected signal. So it's very hard for you to receive and decode the reflected signal. And the reason why it's very hard for you to decode the signal, that's because the reflected signal here share the same channel as the transmitter Wi-Fi signal. And usually, this, the power difference between the two signals is larger than 30 dB. And you are, it's very hard for you to estimate the small signal here. So how do, we, how do we solve this problem? Our key observation here is that we found that the reflected signal, the red signal BT here, is a time domain superimposed between the incoming Wi-Fi signal ST here and the local tech signal tech T here. It's a time domain superimposed between the two signals. As a result, if we increase the frequency of the local tech signal here, we are able to move the reflected signal to a different channel such that in the interference becomes really small. Right? It's great. We are able to reduce the interference from the primary Wi-Fi signal. Unfortunately, if you implement the system, you will figure out another trouble. In addition to create the signal, the desired signal on the left side, you also create the undesired signal on the left side. That's because of the time domain superimposed operation that you introduced. Ideally, we want to eliminate the undesired signal on the left side because it will be interference for other Wi-Fi devices and it's useless. How do we eliminate the undesired signal on the left side? We design very special circuits. In this system, we take the signal, incoming signal, and split the signal into two paths. The signal on the first pass is exactly the same as the input wireless signal. Then we do a small modification on the signal on the second pass. On the left side of the signal, we re reverse the signal. And the, on the right side, we keep the signal the same. Then we add the two signals on the two paths together. The left part cancel with each other. The right part remains the same. By doing so, we are able to eliminate the undesired signal on the left side and keep the desired signal on the right side. Here is a prototype of the hardware system that we built. This one is an energy detector which detects the presence of a Wi-Fi packet. If a Wi-Fi packet is detected, we will run the corresponding code word translator in a FPGA here. And this code word translator will transform a code word to another different code word and reflect the signal back to the Wi-Fi receiver using the reflection module here. The power consumption of the system we built using the discrete components is roughly around 2.5 milliamp, which is 10 times smaller compared to Bluetooth and 100 times smaller compared to Wi-Fi. I want to mention here, we are compared against ASICs, but using our device, adjust the PCB version of our prototype, which means that if you have an ASIC design of our system, we could get even lower power. We could use this system to build many interesting low power sensing applications. For example, we build a speech and vision sensing system for and use this system for teaching the undergraduate uh, course in Stanford. Uh, in this platform, we ask a student to, uh, we give the students a bare bone PCB board. The students solder the components on the PCB board and write firmware in the microcontroller. They use this code to talk to the camera and talk to the microphone. Once you get the sensor data, you can either stream the data back to the PC over the serial interface, store the data, or backscatter the data <coughs> over the backscatter radio interface. Here are several examples of the uh, system that the students built. For example, the students built the speech recognition system. And a quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So this is uh, one of the speech rec uh, uh, recorded by the students. And you can see that their system is able to accurately recognize the speech that is recorded by this bot. The recognition happens on the PC side. The recognition happens on the PC side. 
And this is a, a low power video streaming system we built using this platform. And we are continuously streaming the video that is captured by this camera over the backs of the video to the, our laptop. What's the resolution? It's a QVJ, so it's a 3, uh, 220, uh, 320 by 240. And the last one is that we ask the students to, one of the students are exploring what kind of application, vision applications can you build on top of this platform. So they are thinking about doing the face recognition using a low power, low resolution camera. And they are examining different parameters, such as distance, to understand how do these factors affect the performance of their uh, vision applications. So to benchmark the performance of our system, we deploy the system in an office building. We have a Wi-Fi transmitter here. And then we deploy our tag one meter away from the Wi-Fi transmitter. Then we use the Wi-Fi receiver to receive the backstory signal and measure how much throughput can we obtain across distance. And in this experiment, when we increase the distance between the uh, tag and the receiver, we can see that at close distance, we are able to achieve around 300 kilobits per second data rate. And the maximum distance between the tag and the receiver is around 42 meters. When we increase the transmission power from the Wi-Fi transmitter to 30 dBm, which is the maximum allowed by FCC, we can find that our operational distance could be larger than 50 meters. So, um, I want to talk a bit more about the impact of my research on um, uh, building the practical back server system. We actually license our inventions to a startup company to commercialize our inventions. Uh, I received a Sigma Bowl doctoral dissertation award and two best paper awards for my inventions on Backscatter. And we, are op we open source our software and hardware platform, which are used by several universities for both research and teaching. And we're using our inventions, we built several other systems. For example, we built the first system that is able to use commercial Wi-Fi access point to localize back server tags. So you don't have to deploy the RFID infrastructure in order to localize the back server tags. We designed a dedicated hardware architecture for streaming the sensor data from back center based sensing systems in a very power efficient fashion. We also build a system that is able to share energy between different wearables. So now we, are, we have discussed how we build a low power wireless uh, link for the IoT device. Instead of optimizing the power consumption of one particular module in an IoT system, I want to take one step back and look at the at system level. How should we efficiently support applications in a power efficient fashion. In particular, I want to answer this question. How could we run software tasks on an energy harvesting device? So we are, when we built the uh, system, when we built some software system for the IoT device, right? For example, we are building the transmission system, sensing system, or the computation system for the IoT device. We usually write some software code and run the code in a microcontroller, right? So this is one example of the code that we'll, we could write that will be running on the microcontroller. So our expectation here is that the code will execute from the first line to the last line, right? That's our expectation. So what are the assumptions that we made here in order to execute the code from the first line to the last line? What are the assumptions we made here? Well, one assumption we made here is, of course, there is no bug, right? <laughs> Otherwise, the code does not run from the first line to the last line. And more specifically, we don't have logical bug, right? That's usually the assumption that we made. But when we build such system for smartphone or the tablets, we actually, we usually made another assumption. The assumption is that we have sufficient energy to execute these pieces of the code. This assumption might be run when we deploy the software system on the energy harvesting system, energy harvesting device. In the energy harvesting device, in particular the micro energy harvesting device, 
we usually have a micro energy harvester which get energy from the solar panel or an RF energy harvester. And these devices usually have a very small energy buffer. The charging and discharging cycle of these devices are very short. It's usually on the order of several milliseconds. As a result, we might not be able to have sufficient energy to run these pieces of code during a single discharging cycle. Let's look at one example here, which is the RFID. Right? If we deploy the RFID, one particular of the network stack in the RFID, the, when the RFID communicates the data packets to the RFID reader, in addition to sending the red packets here, the RFID usually have to send several hand handshake messages between the RFID reader and RFID tag. If any of the message fail due to energy outage, the communication task fail. The reason why it fails is that the whole, the, in order to transmit the red message here, it has to transmit the blue message. That's the smallest number of the task unit that is defined by the RFID system. And the smallest the task unit defined by the RFID system might be too large compared to a tiny energy buffer it has. So how do we address this problem? Well, we could pack more energy, right? We could put some batteries on RFID. But this does not solve all the problem. For some devices, due to the form factor constraint, we cannot pack lots of battery. And even if we pack lots of battery, we might not be, it might not be sufficient for supporting some complicated applications. Another solution is that we can train, teach the programmers, teach the engineers. Unfortunately, the engineers do not like this solution. <coughs> Building software is already very hard. Learning the hardware is even harder. So they don't want to get into the trouble of dealing with both the issues in the hard software level as well as the hardware level. A third solution is we could probably push the overhead to the compiler, right? When the compiler converts the source code to the binary, it might be able to deal with the potential energy outage that could happen. Some people tried that. Unfortunately, the hard part here is that the underlying energy harvesting rate is unpredictable and there is a lot. So it's very hard to guarantee that the code can execute successfully without energy outage. So our approach here is that we want to design a runtime system. Ideally, by running the runtime system that we design, the, from the perspective of the programmer, we have infinite energy to run the application. And then the runtime system is able to deal with all the variabilities of underlying energy harvesting. So if you look at the design of the system, it sounds like it's very similar to the virtual machine, right? It's basically managing the underlying resources in terms of energy for the programmers. But if you, when you design the underlying the runtime system, you have to be really careful. The reason is that you, the runtime system has to be lightweight. Otherwise, the runtime system itself will introduce big overhead of running, of consuming a tiny amount of energy. It has to respond very fast because the charging and discharging cycle is on the order of several milliseconds. It has to support various software tasks. We cannot design the runtime system for one particular task here. So how do we, what's the principle we use to, for designing such runtime system? Well, in our runtime system de design, we take the task that, is that is, was written by the programmers and we break this task into small pieces. We make sure that each small piece can be executed successfully by the, um, by, uh, within a single discharging cycle. So in addition to get providing the guarantee that we are able to execute the task successfully, we all, all, our system also m maximize the rate of running such tasks. So uh, having discussed how we design the runtime system, I'd like to explain a bit more about what I want to do in the future. 
In the future, I want to explore several directions. One is a VR and AR domain. For example, I want to design a low power but accurate motion tracking system for the VR and AR applications. Existing motion trackers, such as HoloLens, which use a vision-based motion tracking system, can seem lots of power. The IR-based motion tracking system, like uh, Oculus, operate at close range. So how could we build a low power, but energy efficient, but accurate uh, motion tracking system for track the, hand, the handset of the VR and AR devices? And how could we design energy efficient computing systems for supporting the VR and AR games? The second direction I want to uh, explore is the mobile health. We are currently working with the Stanford Medical School to track the medical device inside of the human body. I would also like to uh, look at, investigate, is it possible for us for, uh, to sense the vital science of the human body without deploying the sensors? So in other words, is it possible for us to use wireless signals to sense the vital signs of the human body? The last direction I want to explore is a bit general in, in terms of the, it's the domain of the IoT. I want to look at, is it possible to provide, to leverage backscatter in the roadmap of the 5G, which connects billions of things? Existing 5G roadmap, they are using the narrowband IoT for connecting low rate but low power devices. So we are thinking about is it possible for us to leverage backsetter to, pro to provide high rate but low power wireless connections for IOTs. And I also would like to explore how could we run the complicated machine learning task on resource constrained energy device. Maybe the edge computing will play a role here. And here is a summary of my research. So I believe that it's possible for us to build continuous operated IoT devices, which are always connected to uh, um, the internet. Due to the time constraint, I cannot cover many of the uh, work that I have done. In particular, I have done some work on optimizing the UHF, uh, UHF RFID system by optimizing the EPC Gen 2 protocols that are used by the UHF RFID system. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. I have a question. For your application, what the power consumption compared to the uh, like the microphone and the, the sensor? Microphone, right? Yeah. I think the microphone power consumption could be very low. The major power consumption come from the AD, analog to digital conversion. So what's the power consumption of the Bluetooth? Bluetooth is very uh, is an order on order twenty milliwatts. Yeah, twenty milliwatts. The microphone could be, it depends on the sampling frequency. It could be under, uh, I think, probably around one hundred microwatts or even lower. Usually, if you get the Bluetooth, also, but um, twenty milliwatts means that Bluetooth is transmitting. So if you Want to reduce the power consumption of Bluetooth, where you usually do is doing the duty cycling. Basically, the reason why Bluetooth, you can achieve very low power for Bluetooth is that you are doing very heavy duty cycling. So the re when we compare the power consumption of our radio versus Bluetooth, we're comparing the power consumption when they are transmitting. Because both of them can do duty cycling, right? So it's possible we do hold the system with the battery free. Our vision right now, no. Right now, uh, for our system, I don't know the power consumption of the microphone because I didn't measure. But for the camera applications, for the camera, we are doing the video streaming, right? The power consumption of the uh, camera board plus the radio board, the power consumption of the two system is four milliamp. That means that you are able to run the system continuously using two AA batteries for one month without any duty cycling. In, in your implementation, if you look at the sort of where the power budget goes, there's the sort of the envelope detector that detects the length of the sort of yeah. some RF received circuit there, and mm -hmm. then there's the, the switching circuit yep. that uh, switches the impedance on and off, mm -hmm. but fairly high frequency so that you can do a channel trick. Yeah. Which which consumes more power? Envelope detector. Envelope the detector. reason is that uh, 
our, we choose a very sensitive envelope detector, which is able to detect the presence of the Wi-Fi packets mm -hmm. as a threshold of minus 50 dBm. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why the envelope detector can send lots of power, mm -hmm. because internally it's doing some amplific amplification. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I, another power-hungry module in our system actually comes from the clock. So because when you are doing the running the cold war transformation, you are actually have to run a high speed clock to ensure that the timing is tight and accurate. So that one consume a lot. Switching the uh, ARP switch does not consume a lot compared to the rest two. So uh, how does the tag detect the, the presence of this uh, uh, packet that it can like, reflect? Did, 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 like, uh, the, I mean, I'm thinking about the scenario that somehow there are other Wi-Fi devices mm -hmm. working on the same channel mm -hmm. as the transmitter. Then you, go you already know. <laughs> you already know. Uh -huh. The reason is that the, uh, there are many devices that could operate simultaneous with a transmitter, uh -huh. but on different channels. On the same channel, <laughs> you already in many cases, only one guy is transmitting sure. because they are doing the carrier sensing, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. But, but, uh, but uh, if, if somehow the other guy wins, mm -hmm. then sends out the data. Mm -hmm. Can the tag detect that, hey, this is a web packet that's not coming from the transmitter, so I should not reflect? Not right now. Okay. Not right now. Um, we don't have uh, this solution. Not reliably. We can partially detect because uh, when the transmitter, the Wi-Fi transmitter, transmit uh, the packets that is designed for the tag, it will transmit following some patent, right? Mm -hmm. So the tag can look at this patent to identify whether this packet comes from the transmitter or from other device. But it does not guarantee 100% accuracy of sure, this th packet does this come from. Is at which layer, in a sense, that in uh, order to recognize this pattern? On the packet lens layer. Uh, then does it consume, uh, how much power will it consume if we need to detect the pattern for every incoming Wi-Fi packet? Ah, I see. So the power consumption, it does not consume much because the envelope de detector is always running. Okay. So it does not introduce extra overhead because you're always trying to detect when the Wi-Fi packet is present. So by measuring the length of the Wi-Fi packet, that does not consume much power okay. because you are using a timer. Sure. Timer is fairly cheap. Sure. So, but just, uh, the, okay, the, the, then maybe that's the reason why it's not really reliable because the lens itself is, uh, it can't fly the easy. Exactly, okay. exactly. That's the reason why it's not reliable. It could be not reliable. Mm -hmm. It's not reliable. In your sort of the evaluation, your the reflector was about a meter away yep. from the source. Mm -hmm. how, how far will it go? Um, it could be uh, around um, ten meters away, oh, okay. our, according to our experience from the Wi-Fi transmitter, and so it's a trade-off. When you increase the distance between the tag and the transmitter, the distance of the ta tag and the receiver will reduce. So. There is a mathematical formulation between the two. So for the receiver to decode the signal, does the receiver need to listen both to the tag and the original Wi-Fi? Yes, the receiver has two Wi-Fi NIC. Any other questions? I guess. Uh, there are no other questions. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And, and, and uh, the one thing is that uh, he has done a lot of work on uh, uh, UHF. UHF RFID as well. So uh -huh. he's, he's here next tomorrow as well. <laughs> of course, he will be busy interviewing. But uh, if you have some questions, you can forward to him. Look at some of his previous work, for example. Yeah, I, I think so. I have some experience on um, either improving the data rate of inventory in the RFID tag by doing the read adap adaptation or optimizing the EPC gentle protocol for uh, improving the data rate. And oh, I also have some experience on building the RFID reader system using SDR. So probably if you have questions in this domain. Do you have any experience trying to do localization of LANs? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because uh, like this one, right? We built, uh, we built um, 
we built a um, localization system to localize the tags using Wi-Fi. Uh, so I think the question, you are not asking this question. I think the question you're asking is the, how do you localize the UHF tag um, using RFID reader, right? So I think the fundamental limitation of the localization comes from the bandwidth you are using. The larger the bandwidth you are using, the more the finer spatial uh, resolution you can have. So if you are using commercial RFID system, the bandwidth you are having is 26 megahertz in US. It starts from the 902 to 928, right? So it's a 26 megahertz bandwidth. So the one way to increase the bandwidth is actually you can send some signals outside of the Wi-Fi, outside of the RFID band. The reason why you can send that and does not violate the FCC regulation. That's because when you are sending the Wi-Fi signal, uh, sorry, <laughs> when you are sending the RFID signal, the signal has to follow some spectrum mask, right? The spectral mask means that beyond this band, the signal has to be several dB lower compared to the RFID signal. But that does not mean that the signal on the other band is zero. So you can actually send a very large signal in the RFID band, but you can send a very small signal on the other band. So I saw a work which used uh, roughly around 200 megahertz on this domain to achieve around centimeter level accuracy on localizing uh, text. It's for the line of sight experiment, so I don't know what's the accuracy for the non-line of sight experiments. Speak again and yeah, thank you. Thanks.